Hello, everybody. Just getting set up here. Give everybody a minute to check in. Can everybody hear me okay? I'm gonna open up this chat window here. Does everybody see that chat on the side there? I'm gonna type hello. This is where you're gonna be able to post questions. And I hope everybody can hear me okay. Okay, great. Everybody's saying yes. Wonderful. Well, it's so great to see everybody tonight, and I'm really looking forward to this webinar. Um, I am recording it, so we will be able to um, share that later. And tonight, we're going to be talking about um, how important it is to take good care of ourselves and how important it is to um, use mindfulness in our everyday practice so that we can really thrive. I find in my uh, work that there are so many people that come to me in crisis or in high need of um, sorting out their issues and problems and life challenges. And I find that it's very complicated for them to do that when they're not really in a place of taking good care of themselves. So this webinar is called You Deserve to Thrive, and that's kind of a theme that I've been working with for um, the last year or so, and I find it to really be resonating with um, a lot of my clients, so I thought I would put it into a approximately about a one-hour presentation and share it with you here tonight. So thanks for tuning in. I really appreciate it. And... Um, that says something to me about how you're putting yourself first and you're giving yourself a chance to learn some new skills, learn some new tools, and um, work towards moving from surviving to thriving. So I wanted to start out um, by sharing a little bit more about how I came to this presentation and what I do um, here in my practice in Gross Point. Um, I decided to do this webinar after I ran a one-day conference called um, Heart-Centered Living and How Do We Live a Heart-Centered Life. And that retreat, that one day workshop was very well received and I thought I would share a lot of that information uh, this evening. So how did I get into mindfulness and self care? Well, I'm gonna tell you a little story about it. In 2002, I was um, a mom of a one year old. My son is now 16 and my daughter's 12, but it was my first child at the time. And um, I had this baby and I was going to graduate school in Ann Arbor at University of Michigan. And I lived about 45 minutes away from the school. And I was also working part time um, at a nearby hospital for my music therapy job. And I was trying to manage too many things. I was always finding that I was feeling really preoccupied with my child when I was at work. And then when I was at work, I was feeling preoccupied with um, school. And when I was at school, I was thinking about home. And it just felt like I was never really able to thrive. <clears throat> I was never really able to use my self-care, use my skills, and um, be the best person I wanted to be. So I remember distinctly leaving a class at the University of Michigan um, one afternoon, and I got to my car, and I felt like the walls were coming in. I felt like my heart started racing. Um, I felt like I hit the wall, literally, and my car wasn't even moving. So I did have this experience of having kind of a, a strong sense of overwhelm, and I would call it a anxiety attack at the time. And I really felt like I needed more support, that I was um, really moving into a space that was really challenging for me and I needed to um, help myself learn some new skills and help cope with how many things I had going on in my life. So I decided to um, go into a therapist office the next week and I found a great therapist who was able to give me a lot of good information about being in the moment and being mindful. 
And she taught me how to be in front of what I was in front of. And that particular day, I remember leaving her office and going home and moving the laundry from the wash to the dryer. But before I could do that, I was pulling the whites out of the dryer. And I remember holding the whites and smelling them and touching them and feeling how warm they were and feeling, you know, just totally in the moment of that load of laundry. And how many loads of laundry have I done since then? A lot. But that was 2002. And it was, it seared in my brain, this experience of being fully in the moment. So I decided um, that I was going to start living in a really mindful way. And so every time um, I did something for the next few weeks, I paused and I took a breath and I brought myself back to the moment. Even the most mundane everyday tasks became more um, satisfying and more enjoying and more enriching because I was bringing my senses and myself to the experience. And I was also allowing myself to be in front of what I was in front of, which is something we can't do when we're trying to manage so many things at once. And I felt not only a shift in my quality of life, but my sense of being really present and my my satisfaction just really increased um, overall. And I didn't feel like when I was at work, I was thinking about the you know, home stuff. And when I was at home, I was thinking about school. I was really fully present. So that's kind of how it all started for me. And I've been teaching mindfulness um, for a really long time. And it's been very helpful. So I wanted to include some of those tips this evening. So in this webinar tonight, we're gonna be talking about um, the red flags of being overwhelmed and the red flags of burnout. So those are two different things. And how to make it better, in my opinion. Um, we won't solve all the problems in a one hour webinar, but I hope to definitely fill up your toolbox with some skills that um, might help you feel like you're able to cope in a new way. So let's dive right in. So we're gonna start with what it means to live a heart-centered life. And that to me has the implication of living a life that's free and easy, living a life that feels full and full of freedom and joy and happiness, and um, that feels less stressed overall. So how do we get there? We get there by allowing ourselves to be vulnerable. We have to embrace vulnerability. And we must know what our priorities and values are. So I always tell people, it's going to be very hard for you to feel like you're um, in a place where you can determine how to establish how you spend time if you're not really clear on what your priorities or values are. So we must also be willing to have authentic connections with people, in my opinion, who have really earned the right to be there. So we can't have authentic connections with everyone in our life, but when we do allow ourselves to be vulnerable and open ourselves up to having rich, authentic connections with people who we really care about and who feel like they care a lot about us, then that provides us a safe space to get reflection, right? So we have then a chance to have a mirror held up to us. And we allow ourselves to then see areas where we could improve or areas that we might need to strengthen and ways that we can redesign our life because truly, right, this is your life by design. And how do you want to live it is the question I ask. Um, so yeah, so we have to have authentic connections with people who have really earned the right to be there. And we must also be willing to accept discomfort. And that includes shame. So if we're not willing to uh, befriend our discomfort, then we are going to find ourselves desperately trying to escape it. So we're going to find ourselves in a place of trying to numb and trying to avoid and trying to escape that discomfort or pain. And um, that leads us down a path, sometimes that can be very dangerous or um, essentially cut us off from real connection, which is I think what we're all longing for. 
And the last part of what it means, in my opinion, to have a heart-centered life is um, that we must be willing to let go of what other people think of us. And that's a really tricky thing to do, and I get how hard that is. Um, so what's at the root of this work? In my opinion, the root of this work has a lot to do with self-love and self-care. Um, and we're going to really go into self-care uh, later in the program. But it really has a lot to do with allowing ourselves to start with the things that we want in our lives, the things we want in relationships, but let them start with us first. Right? So we're going to require a deep sense of acceptance and we're going to give ourselves permission. And what does that mean? Permission to have ugly, messy, permission to make mistakes, permission to do it wrong, permission to be really afraid and show up anyway. And those things I think are really fundamental in countering that feeling of stress and overwhelm because we sometimes artificially create stress and overwhelm um, by the thoughts that we're having. And I deal with that a lot in my practice. I help people understand, like really take a moment to look at your thoughts and move them into the appropriate category of distortion versus reality. And then really recognize how those thoughts can contribute to how you feel. And those feelings really dictate your behavior. That's cognitive behavioral therapy in a nutshell. But beyond that, the root of this work has a lot to do, again, with self-love, self-care, acceptance, and permission, but also forgiveness. And I think that's a big one that's actually really hard for us to do uh, for lots of reasons. And we want to hold on to things that have hurt us or things that have caused us pain and discomfort. And that's only hurting us, right? So the forgiveness piece is important, too, because it truly sets us free. So we want to try to be in a space, all of this is representing a space of being gentle, of being your own compassionate witness. Um, and I'm gonna describe later a little bit more about what that means, being a compassionate witness is kind of a term we use a lot in therapy. And um, I think it's a really good place to live. And it can certainly not only help yourself, but help other people too. So embracing our discomfort, we really need to do that. That requires a willingness to be vulnerable and a willingness to befriend that instead of, again, avoiding that pain or suffering or discomfort, escaping it, hiding it, or numbing it. And I've heard before in um, some really important talks, Brene Brown has echoed this, um, Sean Aker says this as well, that we are um, the most overweight, addicted, consumption-driven, materialistic country in the world. And why is that? I think it has a lot to do with our um, unwillingness to suffer or be in a state of discomfort. And I'm not suggesting we should prolong that. I'm just suggesting that if we can accept that it's normal, then I think we're going to find that um, that will allow us to recognize the temporary nature of that discomfort and not work so hard against it. Because sometimes then we're making it worse by doing that. So does that all make sense? Um, I'm going to take questions at the end, but if anybody wants to chime in um, with anything right now, feel free and I can, I can try to read the, the chat and the questions. So let's go into a couple of the warning signs. Um, and this is important because I think these are indicators that we've lost our way, that our sense of stress and overwhelm and um, being in a place of, you know, encroaching on burnout is really getting close. And so how do we know that's happening? We want to look at the red flags here. The warning signs include, in my opinion, when we notice judgment in our behavior. And for those of you that um, follow along on my newsletter, you might have seen my last blog where I talked about judgment and gossip. And I'm going to share a little bit more about that story in a few moments here. But that, that's a big deal. When we feel um, a sense of shame and vulnerability, we want to push that away. And we're, we're kind of seeking someone who's doing it worse. And then we want to illuminate that. That's, that's where judgment comes from. 
And I did it myself and I was not uh, too proud to share. And I think it's important that we all recognize there's room to heal and um, process. So the red flags of being overwhelmed. Judgment is present. Um, gossip, you can see that. Also, when we have a lot of sense of irritability and agitation and anger, um, but even beyond anger and agitation, irritability, what I find to be more dangerous than that is a sense of apathy and indifference. And so we do need to pay careful attention to what's going on there because when we've got apathy and indifference, we're quite shut down to the world. Um, we have that I don't care attitude and that I think is even scarier and a little bit more um, a larger red flag, if you will, than anger or irritability. Um, another red flag is when you find that you have a sense of unrelenting pain, unrelenting emotional, psychological, or spiritual pain, and that's not, not associated with large things like uh, grief and loss or that kind of experience of pain and suffering, but I'm talking more about something that doesn't shift for two to four weeks at a time, where you wake up every day and no matter how much self-care you infuse or how much rest or how much um, outlets for stress or how many things you do to try to buffer it, nothing really changes, then that's a big warning sign, a big red flag that your stress and your sense of overwhelm have gone too far. Um, again, sometimes this is happening to us and sometimes it's self-induced. So um, sometimes we create this. Sometimes it's coming from us. So we do need to tune in well enough to understand what's going on here and how can we unpack it so that we can sort it out and make, um, and make it better. So I wanna to touch on judgment because this is a big topic. And um, I, I, again, I shared a little bit more personally with a story um, in my most recent blog. And I'll share that here for those of you that didn't uh, read that yet. And it's a, it's a little embarrassing, but I'm willing to share that because I feel like I learned something from that and I wanted to um, you know, allow that lesson to be translated to you too. And in March and April, I was traveling a lot. I was speaking uh, coast to coast. I did um, a lot of lectures and presentations out of state, and I was running a retreat out of state. And I really kind of overextended. I overcommitted, but I really wanted to do all of it. And I felt guilty that I was so unavailable to my family and my kids. Um, and they're older. They're in high school and middle school. They're really self-sufficient. I'm very fortunate. They're so independent. But I did feel a lot of mother shame and guilt, like, oh my gosh, what if they really need me and I'm not there? And, you know, my husband's here and my family's here and everyone's here to help out. But I felt it personally. So when I got back from that, I was, um, you know, unpacking and getting settled and um, doing a couple other, I did a day retreat recently and some other busy things. And I have felt very preoccupied just kind of doing a lot of work on my computer after work in my office all day. And I have just carried over this sense of guilt that um, I'm just not as available to my family as I, as I wanted to be. And we were in a store and I saw um, a mother who looked very tired and worn out walking about six steps ahead of her two-year-old child who was crying and very sad and kind of reaching out for mom to pick her up and i i just couldn't like stop noticing it and it struck me really intensely where normally i've been with crying babies before i've been behind them on an airplane i've been with around them in a restaurant it's not like um that's a new experience for any of us but for some reason this kind of hit me a little harder and i immediately had a trigger and I was about ready to swipe my credit card. I think it was at Trader Joe's and I was about ready to swipe my card and I kind of looked towards the mom and I said something out loud with an earshot of her so that she would hear me judging her and, and consequently so that she would pick up the child and soothe the child, hopefully, and that I'd be the, the you know hero in this. But beyond that, that's not even right. It, it was more about me taking away my discomfort. I was so uncomfortable with it because it felt like a reflection of an unmet need in this child with the mom 
unavailable to her. And it triggered me. So I said kind of out loud, oh, somebody's really sad, you know, she wants to be picked up. And I kind of like leaned over and said it really loud. And my kids looked at me like, mom, you know, <laughs> they were really embarrassed. And I suddenly realized what I did. And then the mom gave me a kind of a look like, lady, you know, I'm exhausted. We're trying to get out of this store and leave me alone. And we got in the car and my um, kids started talking to me about it. And my son said, that sounded like a lot of judgment, mom. I'm wondering what's going on. So if we allow our loved ones to hold a mirror up to us, then we can learn a lot from them and, and that reflection that they bring to us. So I sat with it. I was uh, processing that and I recognized where it came from. You know, we have to remember that staying um, out of judgment requires, and this is a quote from Brene Brown, understanding the areas where we're the most vulnerable to shame ourselves. So I had to really sit with that and process it. I mean, we don't judge others in areas where we have a strong sense of stability and security, but we do judge others when we feel the most vulnerable in an area that's triggering us. And then we're scanning our environment, kind of looking for someone that might be doing it worse. And then we want to highlight that. It happens all the time, especially in parenting. Um, it's like a hotbed of judgment, but so is other things. So are other things like body image. Um, a lot of women, of course, feel very self-conscious and men too about their um, looks, about their weight, about their hair or their clothing. And that's why we judge. That's why we would judge other people in that way. Um, marital happiness, financial success or status, um, even everything from like hosting a party. You know, I've hosted a party before where I put out a lovely spread and somebody came in and criticized my tablecloth. And I thought, really? But it's because they are feeling triggered and shamed themselves. And so they have to try to find something that they think is a little off in what I did and then kind of reduce me by trying to elevate themselves. So judgment really shows up when it kind of comes through the cracks, you know, where we feel a little bit broken um, in our resiliency, if that makes sense. And it goes hand in hand with shame, right? And shame has something to do with judgment too, because we don't like that feeling, right? So then we judge, but we also want to recognize that shame grows when we hide. Shame grows when we stay in secrecy and shame grows when we stay silent. That's why there's a lot of power in sharing and therapy because we build up safety in this environment, in this container, in this therapeutic relationship where people can share shame stories and things that they feel vulnerable about and um, essentially break that down and recognize that by sharing it, we um, are still whole, right? It doesn't change who we are. It doesn't change our experience in the world or how people think of us. It, it is um, recognizing something that's normal. We all feel those things. We all feel that. And you can't escape it. That's something that people try very hard to do. And they try hard to escape vulnerability. They try hard to hide from shame. But it's normal to have those experiences. And I think we need to um, learn better tools to help us cope with it when it does arise. Um, so if you really want connection, if you really want to live a more heart-centered life, one that feels less in a chronic state of overwhelm, less stressed, um, then you must really em embrace the places, in my opinion, um, where you feel most vulnerable and be able to um, address that and look at it and sit with it and process it, like I just shared about the story with the um, mother and daughter in the store. So burnout, in my opinion, is 
really the 911 of stress and overload. Burnout is very different from stress and being overwhelmed because there are three hallmark pieces of burnout. And I've, I've seen a couple clients who have really hit the wall and they've been in a state of burnout uh, where they had to take a medical leave of absence or they needed to um, make a major life decision or life change at that time. And um, what we recognize about burnout is that it doesn't bounce back from rest. So people need to recognize there are three major components of burnout, and one is emotional exhaustion. And it doesn't go away when you take a vacation, and it doesn't go away when you rest. Um, so that's something that um, is very different from just regular stress, where with regular stress, if you take a break and you replenish and recharge and restore and renew yourself, then you usually come back feeling like you've been able to fill up your resiliency, fill up your cup, as I say, so that you're more in abundance again and you have more to draw from in that well. But with burnout, it's very hard to do that and you don't recover from resting. The second component of burnout that is part of this um, that's very different from just regular stress is you get into a state of depersonalizing people and situations you've sort of dehumanized to create distance because you really have nothing left to give and you become somewhat cynical and sarcastic. Your attitude can be quite callous and negative and uncaring. Um, and when you recognize that behavior, it's important to know, oh, wow, I'm really, I'm really in a place of burnout, not just stress. So I really want to distinguish the difference here tonight. And then the third component of burnout is the reduced accomplishment or lack of efficacy. So that people sometimes get to a point where they think, what's the use? If I do this, nothing changes. If I do that, nothing changes. Or at work, you know, I don't have much hope. I try this at work and um, it's still just as bad. Or I try this with my schedule and it's still just as bad. So this sense of lack of efficacy is also part of um, burnout and overwhelm. So there is a real difference between the two of those, and I think some people were asking me to distinguish that before this presentation tonight, so I really wanted to make that clear. Um, so moving on to what helps us thrive. Um, this is really important. This is, the, this is the toolbox that we're building here tonight in this course, and it starts with self-care. And like I said, I often have people come to me for their first session and they feel very um, overwhelmed, they feel very emotional, very raw, very vulnerable, and sometimes they're in crisis. And I always listen very carefully to the first couple sessions on what's coming up for them and how are they feeling, how are they processing, what's their family history and all those things that contribute to where they are today. But I'm also listening really carefully for things like, how are you sleeping? Um, how are you taking good care of yourself? Are you able to take good care of yourself? Sometimes we can't when we're in the middle of crisis or big challenges. Um, are we able to eat well? Are we able to move our bodies and exercise? Are we able to drink enough water and um, have outlets for stress and have enough time for play and rest and creativity or hobbies? Um, but sleep is really a big one. And when I work with people around that and try to clean that pillar of self-care up first, then I find that their coping in general is a little bit stronger. So they're really able to come to their challenges feeling uh, more rested and feeling more ready to tune in to know, okay, what can I do now about this? Rather than feeling in like a five alarm fire situation at that time. So with self-care, I also try to make people recognize it's not selfish, it's self-care, right? There's a difference. So it's not selfish to say, wow, I'm feeling really stressed. What do I need? When I was going through that scenario with the baby and the school and the work and the home life and all these other things, I felt like whenever I had a free hour in the year 2002, um, if, if the baby was napping or if, um, you know, I was done writing a paper or whatever, I would run around my house like a crazy chicken with my head cut off trying to do a thousand things at once. 
when really what I needed to do was stop and again, insert the pause and ask myself, what do I need? And when I started to learn how to do that with my great therapist that I worked with at that time, um, she was telling me, you know, you really got to tune in here and, and figure out is what's the right next step? What's the next thing you should be doing? And when I allowed myself permission to do what I needed to do, I was able to sometimes just sit down on the couch and read a magazine, even though the dishes were piling up or there was laundry that should be getting done. But I thought right now I have a break. Maybe I need to rest. Um, and sometimes I thought maybe I need to nap or maybe I need to exercise or maybe I need to cook something now so I don't have to cook it later. I mean, there's lots of ways to tune in. There's lots of ways of uh, skill building that will help us here. But the self-care and awareness is so important. The other part of this that's really gonna help us thrive is, I mentioned before, prioritizing our values and really knowing yourself. Um, I remember learning a lot about the Myers-Briggs test and understanding introvert, extrovert, and I always felt like I'm, I'm a very social person. I love to engage with people. People think I'm really extroverted and I am really engaging, but I'm definitely an introvert because I like to recharge alone. And I always felt kind of bad about that and guilty about that. But once I recognized, oh, that's just a marker of helping me understand what I need, then I allowed myself to take that without shame or without apology. So I think that's really important too. We need to be able to prioritize our values and really know who we are so that we know how to spend our time. Our value set is our compass, right? So if we can allow ourselves to um, be in a space of recognizing maybe maybe even just take the summer to tune into what are your values i did this exercise um, in my one day um, heart-centered living retreat and we talked about um, picking values for the summer making this your season of self and recognizing um, what values will help you stay in check with how you spend your time um, so that's something to think about too and then coming into the description of um, compassionate witnessing. So to be a compassionate witness, in my opinion, means that you suspend judgment and that we do this for ourselves first, right? We are first able to compassionately witness our own thoughts and behavior. For example, with the um, child crying in the store, I didn't judge myself any further than that. I got in the car with my kids and we started to talk about it and they were modeling a compassionate witness to me because they were like, huh, I noticed that you did that. What's coming up? And I was able to be a compassionate witness to myself. So we need to be gentle. You know, we need to be forgiving. We need to be accepting and we need to give ourselves permission. And those are all really important skills that sometimes we just cannot access because I think there's unfortunately a way of shutting that down when we feel um, overwhelmed. And so that's part of that too. Um, another part of thriving, in my opinion, is empathy. So this is huge. And I think we can really learn to not only be empathic to our friends or loved ones, but we can help lift each other up by increasing our own empathy skills by, by being empathetic to ourselves first too, right? I always talk about that airbag um, idea of an airplane, sort of first assist yourself and then your neighbor. That's a great mantra for self-care. It's not selfish to tune in to what you need first. Um, so empathy has a lot to do with putting ourselves in someone else's shoes and connecting with how they're feeling. And it requires us to be vulnerable. Um, we have to be able to say, wow, I hear you. I know that feeling and I have felt that before myself. So that requires you to be a little bit uncomfortable sometimes by um, cozying up to that discomfort and then saying things like, and you're not alone in this, you know, like I get you. I understand. It's very different from sympathy. So sympathy is something where we feel sorry for someone, um, but we want to stay distant from that pain, right? We're very sorry for you and your pain, but it's not mine, you know? Empathy says, I got you, I feel you, I understand you, I know you, and you're not alone. 
we don't also have to have all the right answers. People always think like, oh, I don't want to make that call to somebody who just got diagnosed with cancer or who's uh, just lost a parent or, um, you know, had gone through a job loss or is going through a divorce. I don't want to do that because I don't know what to say. And I always tell them, you don't have to fix it. You don't have to have the right answers. You just have to be willing to be present and to love that person and yourself enough to be unconditionally non-judgmental in that moment and say, I hear you. I, I feel what that feels like. I know that. I'm sorry. And even if you don't, um, you don't have to say it that way. You don't have to say, I, I feel what you're feeling. But just to have empathy means I'm here with you and I'm present to it and I, I understand. So the other section here of how we thrive, um, in my opinion, has a lot to do with gratitude. So I can find myself easily slipping. When I'm stressed, I find myself sliding down the scarcity hill, and I find that I move into um, scarcity thinking where I'm thinking a lot of this is not enough or this is not right or there's not going to be enough of that or that help wasn't enough for me or this person didn't do enough this way or that way. And scarcity um, really doesn't help us live an abundant life, right? So we need to move ourselves over to abundance. And how do we do that? We do it with gratitude. So when I start to slide down the scarcity hill, I just pause, again, insert the pause, I love the pause button, and we allow ourselves to move from scarcity to abundance with gratitude. So gratitude practices um, can really help us focus on a bigger umbrella of seeing the whole picture. Scarcity kind of brings us into a narrow lens, and abundance helps us kind of broaden um, broaden things. So we really want to practice gratitude and maybe it becomes a muscle that you strengthen by doing a gratitude journal. Maybe the summer is a great time to jot down a couple things you feel grateful for on a regular basis. Or maybe it's also something that you do on your commute to work or shuttling kids here and there. Um, I did this practice last year um, in the winter time, it was just one of those long stretches of bad Michigan weather, and there, you know, we had just all kind of gone through having colds in our house, and the dog was sick too, and like there were just so many things going on. And there was testing for school, and I had some work stress, and like there was just a lot of stuff going on in my um, family um, circle here. And what I found was we were all kind of kibitzing and complaining, and um, really feeling a lot of scarcity on the on the commute to school that morning and I didn't like it and I thought you know what you can't start your day like this for yourself or for your family and all of us were joining it it was like one person kind of infected the other and we all were in this scarcity bubble um, so I decided to switch it midway through the commute it's not that long that we're driving but it was miraculous because in about two minutes time we had all moved ourselves from scarcity to abundance by just saying, okay, let's pause here. We know there are some struggles. We all have been stressed and not feeling great or whatever, but what kinds of things are we really feeling good about? Where are the positives? Um, and this isn't placating. This isn't silver lining it. This is a strategy to move us from scarcity to abundance. Um, I have a client who talked to me about this really cool concept called the joy call. And he said that once um, a week or once a month, I can't remember now, um, he calls a friend that lives out of state and they um, share joys. And I just thought, how cool is that? Because sometimes we pick up the phone only to complain. You know, we do that with all kinds of things, social media and texting and emailing or whatever. So why not designate um, a form of contact with someone that's really built around joy? Can we do that? And would that make a difference? So learning how to thrive in our lives um, is really something that we have to practice. Um, it involves a lot of skill building and tools in the toolbox. And I hope that maybe some of these are practices that you can bring in to your life. Um, so I'm going to open it up. We're almost 40 minutes in to questions that you might have, things that aren't clear or things you want me to answer. Um, so feel free to type those in the chat if you want to. Um, I'd be happy to answer anything that you want to share. Anybody has questions?
this is kind of a new format for me um, using this Zoom meeting platform. So I am not totally sure how the chats come through here, but I'm looking on that sidebar. So feel free if you want to share a question with me. Okay, we have a question here. Um, is there any specific signs of emotional exhaustion? Oh, yes. So one of the, one of the hallmarks of that is, um, again, feeling like you, you have apathy and indifference. So when you get to a point where you feel emotionally exhausted, you almost have nothing left to give. So I always, I always um, link burnout to like hitting the bottom and then running on fumes and then running beyond running on fumes. So it's like, it's way more than just stress again. But signs of emotional exhaustion have a lot to do with us feeling like you can't recover that you can't, there's nothing that you can do that makes it feel lighter or better in that moment. It requires significant break in what you're doing every day and a significant willingness to make a life change. Um, so that is, those are kind of the hallmark um, areas of emotional exhaustion, in my opinion. And that is it's something that we really um, need to pay careful attention to and reach out for professional help when you are noticing that that's coming up. You might Prior to feeling emotionally exhausted and drained, you might also feel that you're stuck in a mood, whether that's being stuck in anxiety or stuck in depression. Um, you might notice signs and symptoms of that. You may feel highly distracted at times, have trouble making decisions, all the same kinds of things that you see with um, depression. You might find that that comes up for you with emotional exhaustion. Does that answer your question? Wonder if see what else people are asking here. I love the idea of switching the mood from scarcity to abundance. What's a good way to catch yourself or the person you're speaking with? Oh, yes. Okay, I have good tips for this. Or the gossip judgment conversation, whether in your own head or with a friend. Tips on recognizing moving forward. I love this question. So, um, and I see your comment. Thank you, Jordan. Um, so, Moving from um, scarcity to abundance, I did it easily with my family because I was in the car and I was just like, hey guys, we need to like make a change here before we all go into our day because I thought I don't want this to be the tone that we set. But when it's with a friend or a colleague, this is tricky. And I've been in work situations before I was in private practice where um, I noticed that people were rather burned out at the place that I worked and they would... Um, be gossiping and judging a lot. And it felt like an outlet uh, for their stress, but it felt like I was slimed, you know, by them. And so what I found worked the best was not joining it. So I found that people would gather in the coffee area by the water cooler and they would dump out all this stuff or they kind of corner you and try to make you join their misery because misery loves company. So they tried to join that with you and make you say, oh yeah, she's like this or whatever. And they would, you know, run on a little judgment train or gossip train. But when I didn't join it, it automatically stopped. So I would hear somebody saying something about somebody else or judging somebody. And I would listen. I wasn't ignoring them, but I just simply said, wow, yeah, that's a lot. And I would make really nothing type statements to make, um, to just allow them to kind of stop. And I found that when they didn't have me hooked on their judgment or gossip, then they didn't come to me to do that anymore because I was no longer fulfilling that for them. So I think that's something that um, really helps. And if it's a good friend um, or someone you know a little bit more than a coworker, you might do more of a validation statement and say, so I'm really hearing how, how that upset you or yeah wow that really feels prickly or whatever your comment is is a way to acknowledge that it's causing that person some discomfort or they're upset about it and when we validate someone that also helps them feel heard and seen 
and then um, they unhook from the need to keep repeating it or rebranding it and <laughs> sending it out in other ways too. So that seems to help a lot um, in my opinion as well. But the not joining I think is really helpful. Oh, you're welcome. Anybody else have questions? I'm curious, um, how many people feel that they can identify with the signs and symptoms of burnout? Or how many people just tuned in tonight to hear more about moving from stress and overwhelm into trying to thrive? I'm curious, if you wanna just type overwhelmed or stress or burnout, then it would be great to kind of, then I can get a better understanding of, um, you know, who's feeling what. And maybe you just tuned in for other things. Okay, so we have a couple turning, tuning in here for burnout. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Everybody's feeling stressed and overwhelmed. So um, it's hard, isn't it, this time of year too, because it's, it's like everybody else seems to be having a great summer and having fun. And that's so hard for us when we feel like inside we're struggling or we're having stress or we, we feel overwhelmed and or burned out and we don't have the capacity um, to join that joy. And then we feel bad about that, right? It can cause us to feel some shame. So that's something to think about too. So looks like mom's green iPad. I love that name. Um, how do you turn your child around? A tween with constant negative attitude. Okay, so sometimes in my opinion, that is a call for help. Um, and when you hear constant negativity, I find it very helpful to do a what we call reflective listening and then validate and then ask, so what do you think is needed here? So it's like a three-step process. So you hear, you hear the complaint, you hear the negativity, you really give yourself a chance to listen with your full self and be fully engaged and present and say something like, so I'm really hearing what you're saying. I'm hearing how upset you are. I'm hearing how hard this is or whatever the complaint is. Did I understand it all? I would ask them to clarify. This is called reflective listening. And it's a way to help the person feel safe enough so that they can fully express themselves. Um, and then we move into validation and empathy. So wow, that must feel really hard to be going through that or to be having that difficulty with your friend group or to be having that pressure with school or whatever it is. Then we do the validation and the empathy. And then we move it into, so what do you think is needed here? Because then you're inviting the person who's complaining or feeling negative to make change. You know, you're kind of empowering them by saying that to say, I'm going to sit with you. I'm going to be next to you. And I'm certainly going to support you in this. But I'm not going to endlessly hear it, constantly be sort of barraged by your negativity or complaining. I want to find a solution to it. So um, what I'm thinking is with that child, they're not really being heard and seen maybe fully in this complaint or their stress or struggle. They might need someone other than you to talk to about that, but it would be important, I think, to, um, to try to be present, to reflect, and then to um, move that into um, a validation statement and then move that into an action, an ask, essentially like, so what do you think you want to do about this and how do you want to change it? So that really empowers the person who's giving the complaint or negativity to consider that they have the power of change. They can actually do something different about it with you sitting next to them supporting them. So I hope that answered that question. And it's winter in Australia. Oh my gosh, you're, call, you're uh, dialing in from Australia. That's so great. I think you're my Twitter friend. Hello. Um, so yes, I'm not sure it's seasonal. Very true, very true. Um, oh, great. I'm so glad you're tuning in. That's wonderful. Sometimes overwhelmed with the current political climate. Oh my goodness, yes. I bet a lot of people can relate to this, um, especially right now, um, considering the immigration crisis. I think there's a lot of secondary trauma happening. I'm hearing it a lot in my practice. Um, 
here in the US uh, with what's happening in our borders. And yes, we have to be very careful to protect ourselves. We wanna stay informed, of course, but we also wanna make sure that we don't feel this chronic sense of um, being uh, overloaded by the stress of the political climate and the news and the information that's coming at us. It's kind of like an avalanche of information every day. So we do have to be really careful about that. Um, we have to take breaks. We have to decide how and where we get our news and information. I personally like to be able to access it when I go to it. I don't want it to come and hit me in the face like through TV with a lot of fear-based messaging. Um, I like to be able to read it where I can take it in context and in my own head and my own tone and I don't have to hear the, you know, the um, fear-based branding that goes on on, um, on on TV news. So. I think it's important that we think about all the ways in our life that we are impacted by stress. And it doesn't only come from an internal place. Obviously, there are outside forces. There are things that feel outside of our control that are contributing to stress. And um, there are lots of ways to counter it, too. And we do have to be able to rest and replenish and recharge. And that's just as important in um, not exposing ourselves to too much news and information. What are some some of the steps one can take related to forgiveness and letting go of painful events? Oh, I have the perfect answer for this. Um, this could be a whole webinar in and of itself, um, but I practice a really sacred um, Hawaiian meditation forgiveness practice called Hopo Ono Ono, and it has changed my life, and that's no small statement. And this is a amazing practice where you essentially take the um, forgiveness um, and uh, let me start over. So basically the practice is four sentences. So I'm going to explain it to you now. This, this practice is four different statements that you would say in your own head to kind of clear the forgiveness and clear the um, injury that you might be feeling. You probably are feeling victimized by what's going on from somebody else who might have said something or done something to hurt you or make you uncomfortable or suffer. So what we do with Hopo Ono Ono is say these four different sentences. And the first one is, I love you. And so you're thinking in your own head, this is like a meditation practice. So you start with, I love you. That's a way of, even if you're feeling really hurt by someone um, and feeling like it doesn't make sense to say that because they're the ones that hurt me. Why do I say I love you? But follow me here. It does make sense. I'm gonna give this to you in an example. I always teach this in an example um, with something that happened with me and my husband. And he was really stressed. We were moving into our new house a couple years ago here in this community. He was going to quit his job and open a business. And we had just moved. We had moved schools for the kids. We had moved our home. I was gonna move my practice uh, within the next six months to a year. So we were really feeling overloaded. And we're getting to know our new house. We had just moved in. And I was standing in the dining room and I was um, playing with the light switches and I just said out loud with an earshot of him, but not with any intention of him taking charge. I said, um, oh, this is so weird. The dimmer switch is not um, attached to the um, chandelier. It's attached to the uh, canister lights in the ceiling. Isn't that strange? And I was just announcing it out loud, like when you discover light switches and things in your house when you first move in. And he exploded because he was already really stressed. And he ran out to the garage, cut open the box, got the drill out, you know, came back in with the parts and the new, you know, thing that he needed to fix that. And he, he's drilling the thing and moving it around and trying to fix it immediately. And he was mad. And I thought, really? Why, you know, what's going on here? So I didn't say anything. I could have gotten defensive, but I went upstairs to our bathroom and I kind of just took a moment. And I did the Hopo Ono Ono. So I said to myself, by myself in the bathroom, I was thinking about my husband and I thought, I love you. Even though right now this is stressful and painful and I don't know why you just had this lash out, but I love you. I care about you and um, I need to recognize that you deserve to be loved and I deserve to be loved and that's a universal truth. The second step of this is I'm sorry. 
And you might be thinking, why are why are I saying I'm sorry? I didn't do anything. I was just talking out loud about the light switches. And then he, you know, got into this big frenzy and kind of blew up at me. And he said, or I said to myself, um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for all the things I might have done, known or unbeknownst to me, um, that I did to create suffering for you. And that could have been any number of things that I'm not even aware of. So for that, I'm deeply sorry because clearly something in me triggered something in you. And then the next one is, so I love you, I'm sorry, please forgive me and I forgive you. And that one is just a neutralizing statement to um, have forgiveness and to be able to say, I forgive you for your reactivity or reaction. There must be something underneath that. And I, I'm not perfect and I make mistakes too. And please forgive me for creating some more stress for you or whatever happened in this dynamic. And then the last statement is thank you, which sounds really ironic when you think about being hurt by someone saying thank you. But the thank you is to reach our highest, most evolved place so that we can um, be grateful for the opportunity to grow in our empathy and grow in our compassion and um, to love deeper and to connect more. And so after I did this, I felt shifted, right? I didn't feel so revved up or kind of defensive. I just felt open and caring and kind and I felt able to hold the accountability. And so I shifted myself and my energy. And then I went downstairs and I um, kind of approached him. He was still, you know, working with the tools and kind of, you know, really gruff and a little bit pissed off. And, you know, I could tell he was prickly. And I just approached him really softly. And I just said, I'm so sorry. That's, you know, you didn't have to do that right now. Or I can't remember exactly what I said. But I took ownership of it. And he um, immediately melted and he looked at me and had tears in his eyes and said, I just feel like I'm going to let you down. I'm going to start this business and I'm going to be so busy. I'm not going to be able to do anything to help you and you're going to need help and I won't be available. And so, I mean, talk about a different response than what it could have been if I was like, Hey, why are you being so crazy about fixing it right now? Like, you know, that would have just been a normal tit for tat, but this is a really interesting practice and you can do it even when you're not connected to the person and even with the, when you have no, um, connection to them at all, where you're not even going back for an apology or anything. I've done it with coworkers. I've done it with people uh, who cut me off on the road. I've done it with, um, you know, political um, environment kind of stuff that's stressing me out right now. I'm kind of trying to think, how am I accountable to some of these things? Am I accountable to some of these things? Can I move into forgiveness myself in a deeper way? Um, so I think that um, that helps a lot. Emily, you said grocery store. Oh, the grocery store. The lady. Are you talking about the lady with the kid? Yeah, I got to hope I know that, right? Because that is, I just felt bad. I gave her, yeah, yeah, you've done it with strangers at the grocery store. Me too, yeah. It's a wonderful tool to be able to, you know, bring into our life and our practice. I think that, um, that's something that we really need to pay attention to. So I don't know if for KP, I don't know if that answered your question there, but that helps me let go of painful events. Um, and it's, that's again, a really simple strategy. It's not going to, you know, cure it tonight, but I thought that teaching that and giving you more information on it would be very helpful. So what are some good strategies to help ease you through a major life-changing event? In this case, illness and balancing work. Now that might take me more than a couple minutes to answer. Um, so I might need to um, talk to you, you know, separately about that and I'd be happy to do that. Um, so I'm going to pause on Michelle's question and I will, Michelle, if you want to, I don't know if I know you personally or not, but if you want to email me, I could make the time to give you a little bit more on that because that one requires more thinking than what I might have time for this evening. And it's important. Um, Jordan says here, I've been doing a thriving journal for 21 days to move away from scarcity. That's a life changer. 
Oh my gosh, that is fantastic. Yes, Thriving Journal. I used to keep a kudos folder um, at my office um, at U of M, and when I had bad days, I would open that up, and um, that just felt like a great way to um, remind myself of the good stuff. So a kudos journal, um, a thriving journal, a gratitude journal, and keeping it separate from other process in your life is important too, so that there's somewhat of an energy protection around that as well. Well, I wanted to, I'm going to get brave here and try to share my screen, because um, I wanted to show you, um, I wonder if you can see that, share screen. Oh, cool, can you see that? I hope you can. Um, so here's my website. For some of you that don't know me, um, I'd love to stay in touch with you. If you're not already on my newsletter, you can go to megangunnell.com. And at the very top here is this subscribe and receive a free giveaway. So when you subscribe to my newsletter, you're going to get two or three emails a month where I share a blog and some tips and tools for um, living our best life and um, I also share a lot of information about my retreats. You can see all that on here um, on my blog or my retreat page. I have a retreat coming up in Costa Rica again. This will be my fifth time returning to Costa Rica in April, so you're all welcome to take a look at that. Um, here's actually a picture of where we're going in Costa Rica, and that's going to be a women's retreat um, in April. And I've got um, a lot of different blogs here that um, on the blog page and more information about some of the things that I do. So feel free to stay connected with me on Twitter or on my professional Facebook page or LinkedIn. And you can also send me an email by just clicking on that um, email icon right there. So with that, I just thought I would say thank you again for tuning in tonight and making yourself a priority. Um, I really appreciate the time and um, your presence tonight. And I hope that I gave you a couple good reminders, a couple good tools for your toolbox. And I hope you learned something new that might make your summer a little bit less stressful. So thanks so much for tuning in. And I hope to do another webinar um, pretty soon. Thank you so much, everybody. We'll see you soon. Bye, guys.